Hello, welcome back to 20 Minutes in the Text. My name is Andrew. And I am Mason. And today is our last conversation in the book of James. Yeah, it's been a good run. It has, it has. Um, you want to give us the uh, Cliff Notes version of uh, James chapter 4 into chapter 5 before we dive in any deeper? <clears throat> yeah, so um, one of the biggest things about uh, James chapter 4 was he talked about worldliness and um, being a friend of the world is being an enemy to God. Um, and we talked about that it's not enjoying creation. God gives us, you know, gives us creation to enjoy. He's the one that created it, right? It's for our good. Um, but when our enjoyment of creation turns to worship of creation, that's when, that's the sort of friend friendliness with the world James is talking about. <clears throat> so we, we've sort of talked about that and, um, you know, how when we realize we're doing this to, to you know, realize the work of the Spirit in us and, and drawing us to repentance. James opens chapter 5 with sort of a similar rant or a similar warning. Mm -hmm. And he's specifically talking to the rich. So essentially, in, in all that he says in verses uh, uh, 1 through 6, which I'll let you read at home, um, what he's saying is, you know, you rich people, essentially, it's hard for you to not be <laughs> damned. Yeah. And so it's, again, so this way, you know, some might be watching this and be like, well, I, I mean, considered to, compared to a lot of other people, you know, I would be considered rich. Right. Um, it's not the fact that you one might have a lot of money, right? It's not the fact that one might drive a new car. Right. It's the same sort of thing that James was talking about in chapter four. If this if these material things become a god to you, if your richness becomes what you worship, that's when there's a problem. And that's when the Spirit then will work within you to draw you to repentance and then also then to receive the Lord's forgiveness once again. So that's how he, that's sort of what chapter 4 is about, and then he pulls that same sort of uh, subject into chapter 5. But then he, you know, returns again. He does a lot of returning and mm -hmm. uh, recapping what he's already said. Yeah, and you know, picking up in verse 7, um, James calls us back to really how he began mm -hmm. the book uh, with this idea of patience and suffering. And so starting in James chapter 7 um, through uh, verse 12, it goes like this. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. So, again, we've got this idea of, of patience, and yeah. steadfastness, um, suffering in trials, but all with this end goal. Framing it again with the end goal in verse 7, until the coming of the Lord. And so, um, we're, we're, we're in this situation where um, until the Lord comes back, we're, we're in this world, right? This world that we're yeah. not supposed to love, and it's... It's going to be not pleasant all the time. Yeah, and I also think it, it's, it's an interesting tie back to, again, back to chapter 4 of, you know, last time we talked about boasting in the day and sort of, you know, thinking about the future and having our plans, right? We, we um, talked about how that, that text sort of hit me. Uh, this is sort of, it, it's sort of in the same realm of this of, you know, you need to be patient in this day, right? Mm -hmm. Be patient in... The sufferings that you are enduring, right? Um, in those sufferings, the Lord is also blessing you, right? Yeah. And he's, the Lord's preparing you. The Lord's yeah. you are growing in the Lord in these mm -hmm. in these times. So be patient and say the the Lord's uh, you know the, the one the Lord is at the door. What does it say? The, the um, what's the the name they use? Who's at the door? Uh, I lost it. The judge. The judge is at the door, right? He's standing at the door. Uh, the time will come uh, when when you know. The last.
past day will come and Jesus will take, it to, uh, take us to himself. But in the meantime, the Lord has given us his gifts for the day. So be patient in them. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, kind of out of the blue, but, but following on the heels of, of this again, we have kind of a, a one-sentence <clears throat> section here. Um, Above all this, do not swear by heaven or earth, um, but simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Uh, we know that Jesus has, has spoken very similar words in his discussion about oaths mm -hmm. uh, and truth-telling. And, um, you know, this is something I think you hear all the time. You hear people say, oh, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And we gl glance over it, we approve of it, we say yes, exactly. And sometimes we don't always stop to think, what are the implications of this? What does it mean? And so um, let's just pause real quick. What does it mean? What's he saying to let your yes be yes and your no be no? It's interesting that you ask the person who's very indecisive what fair enough yes fair and yes and no and no is. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that, I mean, you could pull a lot of things from this text. I think when it comes to oath, you know, just the implications in your earthly life, right? Being lukewarm about a situation yeah. or being very indecisive about a situation uh, will condemn you amongst others, <laughs> right? So, you know, hey, um, let's just say we're not in a pandemic right now. Hey, okay. uh, Andrew, uh, I'm gonna we're, let's go to the movies. Cool. And I'll pick you up at seven. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll probably seven. I yeah, I'll probably be there around seven, right? Maybe yeah, maybe. Okay. What if I'm not there till nine, right? Yeah. You're seeing a much later movie. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Right. So it's if it's, we're going at all. There's yeah. there's implications to not just saying, you know, a lot of people have trouble saying no. I think when the uh, when it comes to sort of the the, the, the spiritual realm, let's say. Okay. And the yes is be yes and your no be no. I mean, Jesus says, you know, he talks just sort of rails against a lukewarm faith. Yeah. Um, it's not so much saying yes to Jesus, right? That's not really what it's, Certainly, you know. Yeah. It's just, um, you know, the lukewarmness of faith. It's either like, yes, you know, it, do you have faith? Yes or no? Right. Like, there's no sort of, there's no, y yes, I have faith. Yes, I know that the gifts that are given are for me. You know, hey, there we go. Right. Or, you know. It's not, you can't sort of have this half faith. Yeah, there's no 47% faithful. Right, right. Yeah, it's, all out. yeah. And it's not to you though. You know, right, it's not, it's, right. look, I'm, I'm gonna earn this, I'm gonna bump my 47 up to a right. 50. Um, the Lord's given it to you, but um, what you do also then still has ramifications. I mean, you could just say, no, I don't want it. Mm -hmm. So, that's a very con convoluted way to explain that. No, that's, that's fair. That's, I mean, that's what this show's all about. <laughs> I mean that's that's what that's what Bible study and is. People are still watching this now. They've 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 lost <laughs> it through, right? Yeah. And uh, I mean, if we're not, if you're not getting into the scriptures and and realizing that it's a tangled plate of spaghetti, yeah. You know, I mean, you're not really reading it, maybe. Yeah. If it makes sense, you're either not getting deep enough, or uh, you're the next prophet. Yeah. But uh, we know that there is no other prophet to come, so um, you're kind of in your own world of hurt at that point. But, um, before we say something ridiculous, uh, let's, let's move on to this last section. So we've got one final point of discussion, one final section in James's epistle here. Um, and it's centered on the topic of prayer. I find that prayer is not a complicated thing. Right? I mean, it's simply a conversation. Right? Prayer is a, a conversation, it is a... Uh, unifying relationship building situation between God and his people, mm -hmm. right? Um, but as much as it's not complicated, it often is one of the hardest spiritual disciplines for people to, yeah. to master, if any human being really can master prayer, right? And so um, I think for me, it's, yeah, I know how to pray. I know what I'm, I'm fine. But then executing that is, is just a very difficult thing. Yeah. Um, and... Yeah. Um, James offers some words about prayer here, and I think, uh, more importantly, the power of prayer. But again, like pretty much everything else in this book, there's, there's a line that you have to, to appreciate between seeing and understanding in the context of Scripture what James is saying and crossing the line into dangerous, yeah. false interpretations. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so with that preamble, uh, let's dive into this last section. It's, it sounds like this. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Mason, the prayer of a righteous person has great power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Okay. These are, these are wonderful statements. They're very encouraging. Yeah. But <laughs> what if? But what if? Stop, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's the question. Let's, let's just set the scenario, right? Um, Mason, those of you out there, how many times have you prayed for something to happen and it didn't happen? It happened. How many of you have prayed for something good and something bad mm -hmm. happened instead? It's very easy to look at a passage like this and put all of the responsibility on you and say, if only I had prayed better. If only I had been more faithful. If only yeah. I had done X, Y, or Z, then maybe God would have listened and answered my prayer. Because the prayer of a righteous person has great power. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That, right? That's just that, that sort of interpretation of the text in sort of the Christian life. And you hear it from tele-evangelists to sort of everyday Joe Schmo. Well, if you were only faithful enough, then your prayer to heal your dying loved one would have been heard and they would have been healed. Yeah. That, that, that thing, or oh, I, I hear it from a prominent tele-evangelist, you know, just, if you believe, then you will succeed. The Lord will bless you materially. And I just want to pull my hair out because it's like, if, I mean, any of you who are watching out there, um, specifically those with a job, but, you know, I think it, it can go to students too, sort of roles that you have. When you are doing your best to do that job and you see someone just ruining that, that same job, that's how I feel every time I watch, like, the televangelists too tell people that. I'm like, I'm working hard here for the Lord. Yeah. Trying to get, you know, get that word out and you're just ruining it. Right? Yeah. So. And so, um, on the surface now, it, it might appear that we're reading one thing and we're saying, you know, so we're reading that the prayer of a righteous person has power to heal. And now we're saying, yeah, but to, to say that it is wrong, um, or, um, you know, these people who are saying you just have enough faith and you're righteous enough to pray. So now it's, we're talking out both sides of our mouth. But, but then you have to understand that we're not looking at this right. We're not seeing this right. The prayer of a righteous person absolutely has power because yes, exactly. God is hearing our prayer. Exactly. And um, most of the time, if not, I should back up, every time that we pray for healing, for someone who is sick, and they are not healed in this life, there's they have received the greater healing. Yeah. So there's a. It's interesting because as you were reading, it says, um, "the and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him back up." Yeah. Or raise him up. Well, what does that mean? Raise him up from sickness, or raise him up from death. You know, like all the, uh, the, yeah. there could be a couple double meanings behind that. I've always taken comfort in, uh, and I've used this quote many times in Bible studies, but uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, when you pray, God will give you what you ask or something better. Mm -hmm. So it might not, to us, seem like it's better. Yeah. We pray for a, a sick or dying loved one, and they die. That doesn't look better to us, right? but it actually is, because now their body, you know, resurrected without pain, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, the things that Jesus does, you know, even when they seem painful for us, um, 
there's blessing in them. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, uh, I mean, you hear about, obviously, again, I mean, these are all specific situations, but you hear about someone who maybe have lost, has lost their job, and it is horrible, mm-hmm. right? There's no doubt about it. There's mourning in that, just like there's mourning of a death, yeah. but also the, when the Lord sort of blesses their time in that, and sort of leads them down a new path. The Lord's still working and blessing and preparing for the next thing. So your prayer, when you pray, God's going to do what you ask or something even better for you, even if you don't realize it. Yeah. And that's that should be comforting, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's comforting to me. Yeah, and now we're back to now we're back to Jesus' name again, right? Yeah. The, right. the prayer of a righteous person has power because we pray in Jesus' name, and Jesus' name has power. Because as a righteous person, I was splashed with water, yeah. and Jesus' name was put on me, and my prayer in Jesus, through Christ, through Jesus, to Jesus, with Jesus, around Jesus, inside and out of Jesus, however you want to so, look at it. Right over here. Right? Yeah. There's power in there, but it's not my power. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. It's Christ's power that, that works in me, that rests in me, and is in me. And it's always to, you know, uh, again, going back to... Whatever you, pr- what it, it, Jesus, John 14, whatever you ask in my name, I will give it to you. Right? Yeah. So, a faithful prayer thing, you know, you know, I want a million dollars, 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 Lord, give me a million dollars. It's like, where did, what name of Jesus did you give them? Oh, the great oh, banker? oh, great money sign. You know, no. <laughs> oh, eternal teller. Yeah, that's the right. thing. No, yeah. no, um, no, that's probably not going to work. But if you say, you know, oh, oh, great comforter. In this time of suffering, I ask for your comfort. Boom, there you go, right? Yeah. Comfort, more comfort. Yeah. Well, great. Mm-hmm. And and as we finish this, there's there's one last place here in verse 19 through 20. Um, James leaves us with some parting words um, about, about those who bring, bring a wanderer uh, back into the fold or someone who is lost into uh, salvation. That, that this person has saved their soul from death. Um, and I think, uh, as James often does, we've got kind of one side of the coin that's this exhortation and this encouragement for us, and yet uh, a comfort of the gospel. That as Christians, yes, here's this exhortation. Uh, if you are working to bring people to the faith, to uh, share your faith with your friends, your neighbors, your family members, and they come into the fold. Yeah. They have been saved from death, yeah. and their soul has been saved. Um, so why should we not want to do that? We should be out there doing that. And on the same side, we, we see that, and we can't help but see that um, that's not our work. Mm-hmm. That when that happens, it's always God's work through the Spirit. It's always through the gospel of Jesus and we are safely within those who have been called out of our wandering right. into the fold. Um, and uh, we have this salvation, and from that salvation, we, we are bringing others uh, into it as well. But sometimes when you have a, a family or friend who's wandered off, who isn't in the mood to hear about your God yeah. or what your God has done, the best thing that we can do for someone is to pray for them. Prayer's got a bad rap, you know, in our country. You know, we don't want your thoughts and prayers, we want action. Well, yes, okay, there's there's something to the fact that, you know, in some ways we need to act, right? But to underestimate the power of prayer is a very dangerous thing. And sometimes that's exactly what, um, you know, is needed to, to begin the process of bringing that wandering one back into the fold. Absolutely. And that, I mean, that does it for the Epistle of James. We have yeah. made it through all five chapters in ten tidy, for the most part, episodes. And uh, we hope that you've enjoyed listening in on our conversation. And uh, I hope that our conversation has spilled over into your living rooms and your dinner tables uh, and your family conversations. Uh, and that, uh, most importantly, we have been together with you in the text of God's Word. Um, and so until we see you again, uh, until next time. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for joining us. And uh, can't wait to have you back here at uh, with us on 20 Minutes in the Text. Bye, everyone. <laughs>